Hi, can everybody see the screen? Good morning. I'm speaking to you from Boston, Massachusetts this morning, and I would like to talk about the disruptive urban planning aspect that creates, in our view, aspects of the smart city. I'm going to focus on several areas. One is a thought we have, which is about how to retool the city, how to reprogram space so that we can build new or regenerate existing areas, what we mean by disruptive planning, and how we build from the bottom up with what we call the smart block and also the smart shed. As Brian said, we are working globally in this area, and our practice is spread between Singapore, London, and New York. In terms of retooling the city, what we can say about many of the spaces, many of the buildings, the technology-related infrastructure, is that what was visible is now very visible and has brand value. And indeed, it's no longer a silent partner to museums and hotels and offices and factories. It is actually essential to the digital-led business that we do today. There is a value proposition. And this value proposition is if we're going to attract and retain highly skilled workforces, or indeed the corporations that they wish to be part of, and more importantly, the startups and the next generation of Industry 4.0 within our cities, then we need state-of-the-art infrastructure and innovative architectural solutions to attract and to retain this very important economic driver. What is smartness? I don't think smartness is necessarily having an office and filling it full of technology or having a factory and filling it full of robots. But rather, it's a series of aspects. It's certainly an 18 or a 24-hour city. We know that there is something we call digital real estate. This is a mixture of big data, energy to power it, and the productive architecture that you can see on the screen, a mixture of uses and products that come together through architecture, infrastructure, landscape and technology. What are the drivers of change? It used to be said that location, location, location is the most important aspect for real estate. We would contend this is not the case and hasn't been for some time. It's where the technologies are, whether you have the infrastructure the capacity to drive a digital-led economy. It's the Internet of Things. It's sharing. It's certainly more autonomous aspects of production and transport. But more important in the future, it will be sending digital sequences to make, build, repair. And also, at the same time, it will be about having the layout and the flexibility to support that. I'd like to give an example of what I'm talking about. Many cities, whether it's London with Wembley, Singapore with the Arena, Boston with Fenway Park, Milan with the San Siro, often have areas that were formerly industrial or their semi uh, brownfield, as we say, i.e., without. Uh, any activity happening there uh, around large stadia which tend to be moved from their original locations. At Wembley, for example, which was in northwest London and was rebuilt some years ago, the idea is to create a community around it and to drive up the economic zone. But there are three design challenges to this. Resilience, urban logistics, because it's a key area for logistics in London, 
and the idea of a citadel, creating something that has a coherent form. If you look at Wembley and you look at the area on the map to the east, you will see that it's full of small industrial buildings, warehouses, logistics, and it's next to rail communication and transport hubs. But it's all very fragmented. At the same time, the stadium is very large and dominates the landscape. The stadiums virtually all the time are empty, so they don't contribute to the life of the area. What the challenge then is how do you reintegrate and retool space and activity so that the focus is on people and on the urban space and not upon some large superstructure like a stadium? If we look at some of the cities that you can see here, in front of us here, there is one from South America. You previously saw one uh, in Asia. What we are asking ourselves is, what could we do that would change? Well, if, for example, we say, what about urban logistics? In front of you is a, a, a diagram which talks about the intensification of land. We know, for example, that as we move towards Industry 4.0 and digital economy, we're also changing the way that we move goods, the way we print and make things. And this is to do with the consolidation of new technologies that drive this economy, if you think of Amazon or Alibaba, etc. But warehouses typically are one story, even if they're very large, and they are very big in terms of the footprint on the ground that they take. Now, we've been building tall data centers going 10 or 12 stories. We know from the logistics around airports that you can take trucks up onto floors that are much uh, stronger than your average warehouse. So we said, well, why not take the logistics and stack it? But why just put this logistics there? Why not put other uses there? Why can't we put data there? Why can't we put productive aspects there? Why can't we actually have the workers for their sport on top if they wish? So we get more from the same footprint. So one of the aspects we think then that would really generate some smartness is to take these different uses and to liberate them by generating a flexibility through a dense urban plan. That allows not some grand vision to take 20 years, but rather we start to build mosaic like blocks in five year chunks. Why do we say five years? Because the average politician, a mayor, or a CEO of a company, and other key aspects, factors, or players in this process tend to be in office or driving a facility or a fund from three to five years. They want to see concrete results. But it's not just about the people that are planning and paying for development or occupying development. It's also about the public and whether the public believe that something is really going to happen. If you can build something that's holistic and standalone, and if you can add to that, then people will believe that something is real and community will build and business will progress. So on this matrix of infrastructure and roads and facilities, we overlay above ground the infrastructure and then the buildings that can be connected to these smart grids and integrated systems. What about this? I mentioned the word citadel. What do we mean by that? The modern city of today will not necessarily look the same as the city of the past with carefully lined boulevards, with town squares. There is a certain aspect to do with density and mixing density in different areas, as you can see on this chart here. What do we mean by that? What we say is that sometimes messy is good. Why do people not want to be on city edge? Why would they prefer to be within a, an area where there's frequency of interaction, where you can have services at your fingertips? It's because you want to be able to respond to the moment, to the opportunity. But more importantly, it's all about connecting. At the same time, if you make or you create something, you want to be able to distribute it. 
There is, however, a need for green space within this blue space that we call the infrastructure. So in this aspect of, we might say, a mosaic, there has to be some way of ordering that. And we always say it's the, the hidden and unseen digital infrastructure. As designers, we use coding and algorithmic programs to design more and more and to differentiate more, differentiate more and more the difference between what we build above and what we build below, but to connect it. If you look at the plan, you'll see that the yellow area, which is currently warehouses, small industries, workshops, etc., is very fragmented without any cohesion. The plan on the left is for housing and for some offices around Wembley, but everything points towards Wembley. We would like to replace the yellow, which is still productive, but increase the intensification, give it something beyond um, this loose amalgam of disconnected businesses, and actually create something that is sustainable and valuable and dense. If we overlay this with grids of 100 metres, approximately in area, we're looking at the aspect of could be phase development here where we decant, move, redistribute and insert either existing or new uses in a different way from what is normally done in terms of real estate development. We're proposing a plug and play, but in this plug and play, it's not offices or warehouses that are the, the first driver or factories. We propose putting a significant structure we call the smart shed which has these multiple productive and logistic uses, it can also be the base camp for building in the area so that we don't spend construction, lay down areas all over. From this initial block, we build out what we call smart blocks. These would be not so dissimilar to a half size block you would have, say in Singapore, near Raffles, Eaton Square in London, but we propose as a different set of uses, or indeed a city block in Berlin. The first phase can be delivered within five years and it's holistic. It has the digital infrastructure, it has the power and energy, it has the fibre, it also has the mix and the density on the footprint that we wish to see. The second phase, again, is not prompted by more populated or automated production facilities, but by another logistics hub, another smart shed. And we continue this process of plugging and playing until we have quite a dense development. But what's significant about this development is not seeing the, a major square or a railway station or an airport at the heart of it. Quite the opposite. It has the smart sheds on the periphery, but still part of the fabric. And as you get towards the centre, it gets denser and denser. And on the edges, we can change the scale if we wish in future phases and make it even more intense like a souk. But reinterpret the idea of a souk where we stack and we mix uses so that all size of business can be part of this area. And one reason for that is that if you're a startup and you have five people or 10 people, and then you grow very quickly to 10, uh, 100 or 1,000, often you're compelled to leave the location that made it attractive for your business in the first place. But in actual fact, both digitally and physically, you can move within this quarter to your accommodation without moving off piste. We think this is an important aspect. People want to be where they feel comfortable, but they also want to be where they have the digital infrastructure and the other companies and services that they need. So at Wembley, we would propose that by following this route, where we have our logical grid of pedestrian and vehicular routes, where we keep large traffic to the smart shed areas, where we take the focus away from large uh, super mega structures as some sort of indication of activity, and rather say it's the density and the fabric that's important, interwoven with the infrastructure that you need to drive that. 
And then we open that, as I said before, to green space, the green space at an intimate level and sometimes along a corridor. And it's through that that we connect to the existing fabric of the larger area of the city. So you can see from this plan that the development, the smart development, the disruptive planning that we're talking about is something that builds up through a series of phases. But the intensity of what we're talking about is a certain cohesion, a certain, we think, quality that is quite different from what you would see around the stadium, which again has been pre-planned. And we can see this growing both within brownfield sites and city edges, or we could see this transplanting and regenerating an existing city quarter. So reprogramming of space is essential. But when we say reprogramming, we are effectively talking about not just what happens with the footprints, but what happens within the variety of real estate. And these are just some indicative views as to what being, would happen there. I mentioned at a smaller level that one of the key building blocks is a smart block. What do we mean by a smart block? We know that innovation districts, whether they're London, Boston, Singapore, Barcelona, are attractive because they have a certain density, a certain cluster of occupants. And these occupants can often afford now to actually outmuscle corporations for real estate. The renaissance of urban manufacturing is changing what happens within cities. It's clean, it's semi-automated, it may be fully automated. Excuse me one minute. That was a digital breaking, I think, from the media. But within cities, we have this renaissance of urban manufacturing, but it's clean. It's not something that has to be hidden. If you think of the glass factory of Volkswagen City in the middle of Dresden, what we're seeing is that we can make and do things. We can actually watch them being made. They add to the vivacity. They also add to the, the meaning of what we think the future can be in terms of designing, making, and distributing our goods. So going back to this question of smart block, we think the city block beats a science or business park. Now that might seem strange, particularly for science parks are sought after as being the way forward, the clean, modern way of doing business. But science parks and business parks have been with us since 1958, since the first one at Palo Alto in California. But if you really analyze a science park or a business park, quite often it's a discrete use in each block. Yes, you will have a whole range of companies there, but are they actually talking to themselves? Are people actually meeting? Or are they staying within their gated blocks or compounds? And they might bump into each other at the mall. What we think is important is having access to people, to workforce, to finance, to connectivity, to branding, to transport, putting all that all together and stacking it up in the air. We think there's a new urban code then. It's not just about retail and residential or hotels and offices, but it's about these uses, fintech, media, creative hubs, even co-opening hubs, data, and 3D printing, media tech, and many other forms, including distribution, that can coexist because they're cleaner and they're predominantly based on electrical energy. So we stack them in the air. This diagram is for what we would see as a perfect balance between productive, sentient, which is silent, but necessary infrastructure, but also other uses that you want to do within the 18 hour day. We also think from working with structural engineers that we can identify zones within buildings which we can change. So we can make the floors weaker by having a simple 
metal tree and timber on top, which we can take out to connect. Or we can strengthen them by raising the reinforcement within the slab so that some parts of it can be changed, including the facade and some left the same. So this brings a new flexible dimension to buildings. It means that tenants or owners can do more quickly without disturbing the rest. If you connect this with transport, if you can connect this to a waste or energy plant, or you can connect this even to a mini nuclear plant, which we call an SMR, then your energy cycle combined with your productive cycle is brought together. And at the middle of that is actually the digital infrastructure as much as it is the people. This is an interpretation of what we think a smart block might look like. And beside it, you can see some offices and data and residential and the transport that goes with it. I mentioned the smart shed. So this other key component is to do with the fact that it's actually the change on the logistics and light industrial that's driving a lot of value at the moment. I was interested to hear in Germany recently at a conference that the sign curve for retail and office in that market is quite tight. It has peaks and troughs over a short period, but the yield on investment is only 4%. Light industrial, which supports productivity, has a much smoother sign curve, so therefore less peaks and troughs, and is actually delivering a yield of 7%. So should we be converting all our areas that were industrial or logistic to residential or to office in cities rather than mixing it as we're proposing. So the smart shed, which is one of the prime movers of what we see is this disruptive urban planning, is something we've been working through with various agents to understand what the approach to the master planning involves. The building, as you can see, it's no longer just a shed. There's a range of uses, including taking the vehicles all the way through. There's a range of infrastructures that are can be bundled, so data, production, even retail at the bottom. You can have, you can have sports at the top, you can have some energy through the photovoltaic fields. But most importantly, it becomes the place at which large logistics are broken down to bite-sized packets which can be moved within this tight cluster that we call the new urban setting. And this smart shed, which we think has its own architectural quality, so it's not just something to be hidden or avoided, but in actual fact it's invested with much in the smart pieces of architecture. And the reason for that is that one of the key aspects for a successful urban environment is a positive perception of what's there. We often walk past the infrastructure that we don't like or ignore it, but in actual fact, it's very clear that if, if we have an attitude about what's around us, and that attitude is generally positive, then that attitude transfers into the way we go about what we do. So. If we're going to take vehicles through buildings, if we're going to have production within, can we do that? Yes, we can, because we're looking at how you would deal with the dampening of sound and vibration, how we can vary the grids to deal with different loads, and how we can do this in a modular way that allows us to create pattern and form that you wouldn't normally associate with that kind of structure. And that translates, as you can see here, into a building that's both solid and at the same time can be transparent, and you can see the activity that's happening. And we would contend that these smart sheds become more important than some of the larger retail or civic monuments you see around areas. So this picture in front of you shows you what happens, or uh, one of the key drivers for this 100-metre strip. And this is what we see as being the way forward to create new uses that are disruptive, but they're actually very productive in what they bring to the city. One other aspect is that we know that there is no such thing as a cloud. The cloud is a physical infrastructure of data. 
have been, been building these networks across the world for over 20 years. They take a phenomenal amount of energy. And at some point in the future, uh, we will have many energy sources like small nuclear or very large waste energy that provides better and more productive power at a price that we can afford that is carbon free. But at the moment, one of the questions is where are we going to put all the data? Where do all the racks sit? They can't all sit in Greenland, where it's cool, because there are different types of servers and computing hubs. There's proximity computing for the nano trade the financial market needs. There is the secure high-end facilities for government defense, and indeed even the financial sector or research. And then, of course, there is the mega-scale computing for the shopping and the gaming and other forms of digital entertainment and business. If you're in a city that has limited space, then the smart block makes sense. The smart shed makes sense. But I actually So having got to 10 or 12 floors, we're now considering that where we can but we don't have enough footprint to mix it, then we have to go high with it. And 20 floors is now the level that we're looking at in Hong Kong. And we're also considering this for Singapore. Do you see in front of you some buildings that we've delivered, which are 10 or 12 stories? But these buildings are not the great boxes that you would associate with data. They're now becoming quite architectonic, they're enigmatic. So we think that this is important, that we have to reconsider every single piece of the urban fabric. Because if we don't, we end up with something that doesn't make sense. So while at this one point, we are being disruptive, at the same point, we are being positive. I'm going to end the talk there and pass back over to Brian. Um, uh, thank you very much, Ian. I think that was uh, refreshing. It's uh, different to uh, you know what uh, disruption looks like from an urban planning uh, and architectural point of view. Um, can I open the floor to any questions? I have one here for Ian. Um, Ian, your idea seem to depend on the concept that when you build something, then the people will come, the businesses will react uh, in a way that uh, will achieve that aim or the, the, the various aims. Uh, historically, has that proven to be correct? Well, that's an interesting question because if you look at certain areas of the world where they are building very, shall we say, artificially planned environments, let's take Mazdar in the Middle East, or indeed some of the new developments in China, you can build uh, predominantly residential or office-led developments and if the other aspects of the mix are not there, i.e. The, the larger uh, mix of urban uses, then the one proposed thing is that rather than moving out of cities to artificial creations, let's look at our cities that we already have, the developed cities. If we can substitute and intensify in areas which may not be associated with activity, but you have the access through transport, and more importantly, the energy and digital infrastructure at day one. We believe that you can transfer some of the existing uses and lay on top of that the new uses 
So at, one of the aspects I think I mentioned was rather than trying to build too much, we focus on the blocks. A block could be split down into half blocks if necessary, or maybe three smart blocks creates a block. As mm -hmm. well. What is interesting is that speaking with a, a leading agent yesterday about Cambridge, Massachusetts here in Boston, he was saying that the city here realizes that some of the high value but very small uh, activities, whether that is uh, you know, what used to be called a tailor, but now you know, fabric designers working with very new types of materials or somebody that's exploring how to, to create uh, a part that might be associated with a new form of say, automation rather than Detroit is here. They want to keep this workshop of the future in the vicinity, but add to it with the other uses. So, uh, no, I would say that um, this is all about retooling something that's already there. The question is, if you don't keep it there and then promote it and encourage it, it won't grow. Okay. Um, I think Benjamin has a question for you. Okay, Ben, go ahead. Benjamin? Okay, I I will ask the next question then. Um, Hi, can you hear me? Okay, that's Benjamin. I can, yes, Ben. Hi, and thank you for the talk. My question was based on the high amount of energy is required by all the data centers. Mm -hmm. What are the alternative energy sources that are being explored right now and how well developed or not are they? Or are we still in uh, uh, basically contributing to the lot of um, carbon footprint? Actually, it's a, a great question, Ben, and I'm glad somebody asked it. Um, one of the reasons why I'm here uh, in, in Boston this week is uh, we're doing research with some professors at MIT and the nuclear site into creating very small power packs of nuclear um, energy, but not the type that melt down or have a Fukushima type scenario. These are um, molten lead uh, small reactors, no taller than two meters, that run super fast and therefore um, can't melt down in the way that you would associate with nuclear. So we think that if you harness very uh, small in terms of production, but carbon-free aspects like what we call ASMR, small modular reactors, that's one way of providing 50, 100 megawatt chunks of energy you, you need to drive these very large data or logistics facilities. We can also, uh, we're looking at a, a scheme uh, at the moment in Europe where we're looking to build 300,000 square feet, 30,000 square meat gross, that is, of data center on the back of a waste energy plant. Uh, the waste energy plant takes the rubbish of four boroughs in this particular city and converts it into electricity. Now, what's interesting about that, Benjamin, is that the unit price of the electricity is less than other forms of electrical production that we go to the grid. We can also connect the data center in with the turbine and the mechanisms of the waste energy plant and create absorption cycle. So there we have another uh, way of producing something from nothing. In actual fact, it's incredibly green. Photovoltaics don't really provide enough power because they you would need a huge amount of area for them yeah. and you also have to have guaranteed sun. Hydroelectric, potentially yes. Wave, potentially yes. But remember, like all forms of 
production, they have to be maintained and they also have what we call outage, which means that you take them out of, of the operation in order to repair or replace. But my bet at the moment uh, is on is on mini nuclear. Um, and I would propose that we will get to a point where with hardened uh, structures that are quite sculptural, that you'll walk past them in these new uh, urban areas we're talking about and not even notice them. In actual fact, if I stood you on 77 Mass Avenue in front of MIT and asked you to point out the research reactor, which would be about the same size, if not actually rather larger, most people that I ask that question to point at the CHP plant, the cogeneration plant, in actual fact, not the silent little building that is, is buying me. So that would be my proposal. Uh, radical one, but it's about, again, public perception. Uh, Ian, I have a, a follow-up question on that for you. Um, and uh, that is, you know, trying to put all of that together, especially with, uh, let's say, a nuclear, well, a mini nuclear uh, plant in the middle of that block. Um, as well as all the other aspects, robotics, drones, um, transport facilities, uh, trying to put all of that in a, well, a, a much smaller space that has been done before, is that a very complex task? Uh, first, no. Second, um, how, how do you think the, the regulators, the, the people who uh, do urban planning will uh, take to these suggestions? Um, both really good questions, and uh, they are questions that uh, that we are uh, actively engaged in pursuing. So I'll take the first one. Um, for those of us who grew up in the industrial city, I grew up in Glasgow. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when I was very young uh, how vibrant the city was in terms of shipyards all the way down the river. Uh, major engineering works, print works, uh, all sorts of activities where I would be walking along the road and train engines would cross the road and you would see different things happening. Um, but the reason why I say that is that, um, excuse me one second, sorry, there's a break in keeps coming from next door. I do apologize. There's a, a radio here that just won't stop, but it will now. Um, just to go back to this. So this complexity existed in the industrial city of what we call the industry, uh, the city of Industry 3.0 for over 80, 100 years. I think the if you think about automatic vehicles, which are probably going to become both for distribution cars, people, buses, more regular, we're going to see perhaps a safer distribution of vehicles or movement. If we're planning vertical and horizontal space, I see no reason why we can't uh, create um, rules and protocols for how space is used. The way that um, you would see within the modern factory, where they have the yellow boxes with both uh, areas that are populated by people and those are purely for machines. The second part of your question then is regulators. Now that's a good um, problem to highlight because we tend to think of codes as being there to safeguard or also to, to promote. Now, if we create an enterprise zone, good idea, but if we then create very rigid rules about how you can operate within that enterprise zone, not such a good idea. One of the aspects that we have to think about then is rather than over time moving everything into monoblocks, so this is the rules for this zone, which can only have housing, or this is the rule for this zone, which can only have retail. I think we need to relook at the planning system 
to understand not building control, which is about the technical design of buildings, but what we mean by development control. Most of the planning legislation is a result of the industrial revolution, the overcrowding, the completely unplanned development that we saw in some cities around the world, Shanghai, London, etc. It was understandable that there needed to be change. But I think that within that was also an anti-urban aspect. And that's why you had people harking back to rural life when you have the garden cities. And of course, garden cities are promoted very heavily even today. But to me, that's avoiding the question of complexity and density that many people, particularly younger people, enjoy the vibrancy, the immediacy, the messiness of urban life. Now, the messiness, by that we mean perhaps the, the mix. But I think that we've got to look at planning and coding and saying it's no longer, say, B1 for office and B8 for warehouse. We need to create planning uh, codes that allow us to mix. So I think we need to radically overhaul planning legislation so that it actually promotes what we think is the next wave of development. Thank you for that. Okay, uh, can I open this to anyone else for the last question? Anyone? Going once, twice. Okay, then I get the last question. Um, so out on a limb here, Ian, uh, out of all the countries uh, in the world embarking on smart cities, oh, hang on, uh, there is one from Tatiana. Uh, urban farming. Okay, how will it fit uh, in future city planning? Where, where, what part does it play here? Um, interesting question, uh, Tatiana. I took a group of students to Milan about three, four years ago, and we posed them three questions, uh, three typologies of building, a data center, an advanced manufacturing plant, or an urban farm. Uh, we went to Lombrati, which was a big disused industrial area in the east side of the city where the scooters and Alfa Romeo cars used to be built and just lies empty now. And we gave everyone the same area for the building. And it was really interesting to see the results that could be achieved. Uh, the, the vertical farm um, wasn't just a vertical farm. Some had vertical vineyards. Others had looked to hydroponics. We looked at the infrastructure, the size of the building, whether you could put other uses with the building. So could you have a vineyard and actually have a wine tasting building and everything else all within the same thing? Um, what were the uh, services you needed for it? And how could you deal with uh, variations in light and air, etc.? cetera? Um, and we were very surprised to find that uh, not surprised, you see, but we were pleasantly surprised to find that urban farming makes sense within this 18-hour city that we're talking about. Um, another example would be that if you have parking, for example, what do you do with parking when it's not being used? What do you do other 12 hours when people are not there? You could use sport. You could have markets. You could have commercial engagement. So we thought, okay, some of the infrastructure of the quarter can then be turned over for the produce that comes from the vertical farm. The vertical farm is sending food direct to the other activities within the area. So, it, interesting enough, a vertical farm is a highly automated farm. The digital processes that are monitoring the growth of the plants are actually telling you when and how you need to feed water, etc. This is a phenomenon that's now being used at a large scale in farming. Um, so if you farmers with automatic vehicles and tractors that are actually managing their crops based on digital analysis, then that would make sense with vertical farming, exactly the same methods, exactly the same digital infrastructure within a, uh, an urban setting. So yes, I think because farming, like making cars, 
is digital ed in the future to optimize the production. Okay. Okay, so that brings us nicely to um, the end of uh, today's session. Um, wherever you are, could you uh, join me in uh, thanking Ian for um, speaking and for enlightening us on this topic? Okay, I'll take that as a yes. And uh, thank you, Ian, for, for sharing this. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining us for this. I hope this has been um, um, eye-opening for you uh, as it has been for me. Um, and you have a good day, and uh, we will catch up uh, shortly. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, everybody, for um, from listening and uh, enjoying those hopefully not too disruptive musical interludes <laughs> here in Boston. <laughs> yeah, you had your <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very bye -bye. much. Have a good day. Goodbye, all.